Welcome to Classical Education, a podcast for those who believe in rediscovering the art of asking questions, engaging in conversation, and attending to the ideas at the heart of well-ordered teaching and learning. Adrian Fries and Trey Bailey invite you to join them on a journey in pursuit of the true, the good, and the beautiful as we participate in the great conversation and listen to the many voices coming from the world of classical education. The Classical Education Podcast is proud to announce our consulting team. Beautiful Teaching is a classical education team consisting of master teachers and field experts. We specialize in professional development for schools, customized consulting, online immersion courses, seminar-led book studies, and comprehensive support for K-12 educators. Collectively, we have experts in the liberal, liberal arts for both classical homeschooling and classroom instruction. Our experiences range in many classical school models from classical charters to private Christian to home educators. If you are interested in connecting with someone to help your school, please visit classicaleducationpodcast.com forward slash consulting. We're proud to announce the launch of our new online courses offering practical and immersion-based sessions. The newest immersive courses include K-12 mimetic instruction sessions that include lessons with live Q&A on mimetic lesson planning. In addition, we have sessions on teaching disputation, well-ordered thinking in a disordered world, this course is for 6th through 12th grade teachers to immerse them in an experience to help guide students towards well-ordered thinking in their writing and discussion. Our online book seminar sessions are also growing. Trey is offering a six-week course on Caldecott's Beauty in the Word. In this course, he will survey historical developments in education, re-examine the classical trivium through the light of the Christian imagination, and see how to give students an education in reality. There are a few more amazing book seminars and immersion courses coming soon. For up-to-date lists and courses, you can visit us at beautifulteaching.coursestorm.com. That's beautifulteaching.coursestorm.com. Or you can simply visit us at classicaleducationpodcast.com forward slash courses. As always, you can also email me at beautifulteaching at gmail.com. Thanks for listening to the show. Well, today we're here to welcome Jason Karos. He serves as a headmaster at Founders Classical Academy in Louisville, Texas. In 2012, he was selected by Hillsdale College Barney Charter School Initiative and Responsive Education Solutions to serve as the first headmaster of Founders Classical Academy, which is a K-12 grade classical charter school. And their annual enrollment at Founders is 935 and um, they have a long waiting list too. In fact, one of the reasons I invited Jason is um, he is an amazing headmaster. My daughter went to his school in high school and just had a great experience. I love your school, Jason. I And I'm anxious to dig into some of the questions that I, you do so many things so well that I was like, I have to have him on the podcast because he's going to help inspire so many other headmasters and inspire many parents who frankly don't know what classical ed is and they're looking into it. And I'm just really excited to um, glean from your wisdom today, Jason. Thank you for coming on. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much for having me. All right. So Trey, I think is going to start us off with our first question. Well, Mr. Carlos, you've spent many years running a classical charter school. And so I wonder if you just kick us off here by telling us a bit about your story and how you became interested in classical education. Okay, sure. Well, I was educated pretty traditionally growing up. I went to, to private Roman Catholic school. And I think at the time that I was going, uh, there were still pretty good remnants of what we would call classical liberal arts education, you know, in place. And so uh, that was my experience, you know, heading into college. And uh, as, a, as a child of immigrants, I, I didn't, you know, really have a whole lot of guidance about, you know, where to go to school. And I went to the place my uncle went and where some of my classmates went, which is Florida State University, got a, you know, a history and a, and a you know, religious education there. 
And, uh, you know, I, I, I thought it was pretty good, you know, overall, but I didn't go to, I didn't go to the university with the intention of becoming an educator, a teacher specifically. I thought I would get a, a type of liberal arts experience. And then uh, I thought about going to seminary after that. But while I was uh, in school, I was teaching, you know, Sunday school classes and sort of found my vocation that way and then decided to become a teacher. And so <clears throat> I ended up teaching in, um, in a public school, in a public high school, got my alternative certification. This was in Florida, uh, married um, the lady who had, you know, become my wife. And she eventually became, you know, a teacher as well. And, you know, as I was teaching, I, I found some things very interesting And because I, I wasn't trained to be a teacher. I didn't have a, have a certification. What I knew really about teaching is what I had experienced growing up. And so I noticed there were some differences right off the bat uh, in, the, in the types of things they were learning in, you know, maybe the preparation the students uh, had not had. And, and, I, and I taught, among other classes, advanced classes like AP US history and so on. And so I could see that the students were naturally intelligent, but were lacking in certain areas when it came to knowledge and, and abilities. And then I started, uh, you know, pursuing a master's degree in, in ed leadership. I thought, well, maybe one day I'll, I'll look into administration. I, I love teaching, so I didn't want to leave the classroom, but I, I did that for, for, for future prospects. And so I taught uh, about seven years at the high school level and then eventually got a district curriculum position. Uh, in a large ISD or school district in Florida, we had about 70 schools, elementary, middle, and high schools. And so I learned quite a bit more uh, about education in that, in that role because of the research I had to do, the teacher training that I was involved with, and then, of course, visiting lots of classrooms you know, all across that school district. And so when, it, when my wife and I had our first child, uh, Elena, and it was time for her to go to school, we were not comfortable uh, sending her to the to the public elementary school, even in this district, you know, where we serve. And we started looking around, and we we discovered this small Christian classical school uh, in in Central Florida, and we enrolled her there. And very quickly, uh, after seeing what she was doing and learning more about the overall experience there, I said to my wife, "Wow, this is this is what I need to be doing. I, I need to somehow break into the classical school world because this is this is my heart. This is this is the way that I've been trained." Uh, and uh, so, you know, it, she was there a few years. Then my son, you know, came in after her. And uh, after she was in school for some time, I, I uh, connected with a friend who was a professor at Hillsdale College at the time, and he told me that Hillsdale was going to be uh, or had started up this initiative to help local organizations and, and people open classical schools around the country. It's called the Barney Charter School Initiative. And he said, you know, hey, take a look at this curriculum, you know, that we have. And uh, I looked at it, you know, very intently and, you know, of course, loved it. And then about a year after that, he said, hey, Jason, you know, w we have a group there. Our, 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 uh, our leaders are going to be sort of screening people to serve as principals or headmasters in these schools that they're going to be working with. You know, I think you ought to you know, send, send your uh, letter of interest in. And so I did. And I went through a, a screening and interview process with them. And, and they said, hey, we, we, we think you'd be a good fit. We like you. We're going to be uh, working with a school in Georgia, one in New Mexico. And, and there's this place called Louisville, Texas, that uh, will be needing a headmaster. Are you interested in moving to any of those places from Florida? And I thought, well, hmm, New Mexico. I don't, don't know much about that. Uh, I don't necessarily see myself there. Georgia sounds pretty good. It's close to Florida, but that, that I'd have to wait of like more than a full year for that one to open. And then Louisville, Texas, I looked that up. I found out it was near Dallas. And I said, well, you know, I'm a, a longtime Dallas Cowboy fan. Uh, let's, <laughs> let's try that place. And so uh, that was one of the reasons. Of that's many, great. I love it. <laughs> yeah, that we moved here. And so that's, that's what brought me. So that's sort of the short story of how I came into the world of classical education and how I ended up here at Founders Classical Academy in Louisville. And so we opened the school in the fall of, of 2012. What sort of qualities do you think these folks uh, noticed in you that, that made them want to peg you for this uh, headmaster position? <laughs> that's, that's a good question. You know, I had teaching experience. I, th I think I, I did a, a pretty good job in the classroom. Uh, I also had administrative experience, but they, when they interviewed me and, and, you know, this, this happened over the course of some months, uh, initially with, you know, sort of some screenings over the phone. And then they actually brought me up to Hillsdale and they, they literally grilled me that had a team in there in this conference room. And, uh, you know, it was, it was pretty intensive. And, you know, they asked me all kinds of philosophical questions about, you know, students, about, uh, educate, you know, how to properly instruct, uh, my favorite books, 
uh, you know, what, what, what I thought about virtue, so forth and so on. And, uh, and then, of course, they asked me particular questions about situational uh, responses, you know, what I had done as a teacher in this circumstance or as an administrator in this. And, um, and I think uh, on the basis of that and the recommendations that they, they looked at, um, they, they thought I was a good fit. Mm -hmm. One of the um, things that I'm interested in hearing from you is, um, as a Christian, mm -hmm. what challenges have you felt personally in starting a classical school that's a public school, for, mm -hmm. one, for one thing? But then in general, what are some of the biggest challenges that you've faced over the years in running a charter school as well? Right. Well, first of all, there's the philosophical question, you know, because the revival of classical education in the 21st century came through, you know, the church, right? Came, came, came from Christians, right? Uh, and I, to this day, you know, the, the great majority of classical schools in the United States you know, are connected to some type of uh, church or another. Um, and, you know, I've even had it posed. In fact, when I, on my first weekend on the job, I was at Hillsdale College at a classical school job fair there. And a headmaster from a Christian classical school uh, who, you know, was very friendly, uh, he asked me like, very seriously, like, how, how, can a, how can a charter school really be, you know, classical because it's not, you know, rooted in the Christian faith and so on? You know, and uh, I had already given that some thought. And, you know, if, if I didn't think there was a connection, I, I, I wouldn't, I probably wouldn't be in, in this role. But, you know, the thing about it is, if we look at the roots of classical education, of course, those extend back to Greece and Rome, uh, pre-Christian, you know, Greece mm -hmm. and Rome. And mm -hmm. we know that uh, the philosophers there, many of them were searching for the things that we say are at the root of what we do, truth, beauty, and goodness, the, the universals. Uh, and, you know, I, uh, I think about visiting Greece, you know, over the years. And if you, sometimes if you go to some of the old, old church buildings there in the narthex, uh, you see these icons, right? So, so Orthodox Church have, have Byzantine icons in them or, you know, Christian icons. And, uh, and sometimes in the narthex, besides, uh, let's say, an icon of Christ or the Virgin Mary and so on, in the back wall, you'd have these figures there without halos, and then when you walk up and, and actually look to see who they are, you see these the names of philosophers, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's sort of expressing this idea that, okay, these guys are not just in the narthex, but they're sort of on the back wall near the door, you know? And it's expressing this, this idea that, okay, well, they didn't have the, the revelation. Uh, they were searching for God. They were searching for the truth through, through, through nature, right? And through reason. And so, you know, this is, this is part of the... Um, you know, part of the, the journey, right? We, you know, we, we say, you know, at our school, just like I think all classical schools, you know, emphasize that, you know, we want students to pursue the summum bonum, you know, or in Greek, ton kalon, you know, the highest good. And while at the, at the school here, you know, we don't have, because we're a, you know, a, a, a class, a, excuse me, a charter school, you know, we don't have worship services, we don't have chapel, we're not praying with the students in class. Uh, we are pursuing those, those highest things. And the education, as you know, doesn't stop uh, when, when the students graduate in 12th grade. They continue. Uh, hopefully, they continue to pursue those, those things. And, you know, as, as for me and my, my wife, you know, we're, we're Orthodox Christians. And so uh, in this country, we're, we're a minority in that sense. Um, we like sort of the idea that, okay, we, we are, as the parents, first of all, we're the most important uh, educators for our children. But we're also certainly the most important uh, faith educators for our children. You know, we want to be able to form them, you know, in our, in our particular confession. And, uh, you know, here at our school, we have people from all kinds of, of backgrounds. Uh, in, because we're in North Texas, mostly Christian, the vast majority are of some type of Christian confession, but it's not uh, connected to one church. And so we have some really interesting, you know, dialogues here, uh, you know, over matters of faith um, so in, in the classroom and outside. And, um, it's it's really beautiful. It's really beautiful. Now that doesn't mean I wouldn't love uh, to have a you know an opportunity to serve in a let's say a Christian classical school. Uh, my my children started in one. My daughter had eight years at one before we moved over here, and she started in in eighth grade. You know, it's a great experience. I, I promote it. I support it. Uh, but here's the thing, you know, as as you know, most students aren't going to have the opportunity. Um, for, for a Christian classical education, if they have a Christian background, number one, because maybe they can't afford it, 
maybe they can't afford tuition or maybe they can't afford to homeschool. Uh, or um, per perhaps, you know, the only, uh, you know, Christian classical school in their neighborhood is connected to a church maybe where they're not comfortable going right. uh, because of their convictions, you know. And so here you have this, this so, so this is sort of the, the democratic element of charter schools in general, but in the case of classical schools, it, this is open to everybody. Every, everybody gets this opportunity to have a, you know, a traditional classical liberal arts and sciences experience. Right. I think that's one of the things that attracted me when I came to work for Responsive Ed as well was the idea that this is a liberal education for all. Mm -hmm. And I think that that is an absolutely good, true and beautiful idea that we have embraced that is different than the tradition, you know, where it was originally just for the boys and for the elite, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> those who had time for leisure. <laughs> You know, I think that's a really beautiful part of the restoration of classical education that we we have the conviction that it is for everyone. And I think that Responsive Ed is doing a great job in that regard and opening mm -hmm. even some of the schools are in, um, you know, communities where they have uh, less opportunities. Mm -hmm. And I think you're the first classical school, charter school in Texas. Is that right? Well, you know, I don't know that we're the first classical charter. There, there might have been another one or two before us, small ones, but we're the first one, certainly part of the Responsive Ed family. Mm -hmm. uh, and now Responsive Ed has close to 20 in Texas and Arkansas. And I think next, as of next fall, we'll have, I think, 21 or 22 schools. That's great. And you're the flagship school. <laughs> That's, well, I, I guess, yeah, I don't know. I don't, yeah. You know, I, I, I don't use that phrase. Because it, you know, sort of connotates certain things. We're we're certainly the first one. Uh, you know, we I think we've been in instrumental to be sure in, in helping, you know, yeah. the others off the ground. And yeah, so that's well, I can was. I can attest to the good and beautiful work you're doing there. And uh, when my daughter was at school there, she really loved the engagement of the beautiful conversations that happened in all her classrooms. And it was very life changing for her to go to school there. Mm -hmm. And I would say it shaped her to be stronger as a Christian, even though it's a, you know, it's, it's an American classical school. And I yes. think Trey may have some questions and we do want to get into what is an American classical uh, model, but Trey, what are, what are you thinking? You want to, you ask? know what, Re really quick, let me just say yeah. something you mentioned about Hannah's experience. We, we had a, a graduate here uh, the same year as my daughter graduated who had gone to a, a Roman Catholic school in kindergarten through eighth grade. And then she completed high school here. And she told me after she graduated, she said, you know, I know this isn't a, quote, religious school, uh, but I learned more about my faith here than I did in all my years at my previous school. And, and that's because of the, the content, the great right. literature, the philosophy, the history we're learning and so on, and, the, and the, the, the deep discussions that we're having. And I think that's, that's actually, you know, one of the distinctions between what we're doing and say a, a conventional public school, and that is, like we're not whitewashing things. I think what's happening in a lot of schools is, okay, we're not going to read this literature because it has these illusions and themes in it, or we're not going to actually teach this history. Uh, you know, and by this, I mean, they cut out a lot of the dynamic of religion, which is one of the main dynamics of teaching history. You know, so we teach all of these things and naturally you're going to have discussions about them. That's true. And we're not, we're not proselytizing. We're not promoting a particular no. thing, you know, but these, these topics are in the minds uh, of the students, right? And not, and not just in class, but outside of class as well. Yeah. I appreciate that remark. And it, it, I think it's connected to the question that's, that's sort of been bubbling up in my mind here. Mm -hmm. I love the, the image that you brought up of the philosophers in the church. And of course, what the church is communicating there through those images is that these people um, were in place and and the the work that they did and the the little bit of light and truth that they that they saw and communicated uh was all paving the way right towards mm -hmm. this fuller revelation uh revelation of truth and of course we see that um you know in the work of dante for example where he has uh, the philosophers um of course uh in in their position there um they're in hell though <laughs> and they're they're sad because they don't have the full revelation of christ so right. what what i guess i'm thinking through is how how do you go about addressing as you said the the, the highest good and helping students 
uh, work towards that um, in your particular context. Mm -hmm. um, what are some of the some of the um, methods, let's say, that, that you go about um, trying to um, instruct and and encourage those conversations? Because you are working in in a in a very unique context that um, the philosophers probably wouldn't have recognized mm -hmm. uh, because of the secular nature of our society, right? So, so the separation in their minds between um, church and state, for example, I mean, well, they didn't have that because that's a, that's a, that's a relatively uh, modern um, addition, let's say, uh, to, to the, the life and work of the educator. So how do you work, and maybe this will get into sort of specifically how, how you operate in this country sort of with the way that we handle this. Um, but, but how do you, how do you sort of navigate those things uh, that would allow students to have the freedom to, to pursue the highest good in a context where um, you have some limitations put on you? Mm -hmm. Well, first of all, I think the, the uh, separation of church and state uh, as it's, as it's <laughs> expressed, you know, is, uh, is maybe, linguistically so, but you can't separate um, faith from the person, right? So we have many, many people on this campus that are believers, uh, including teachers, right? And so, you know, first and foremost, I would say as a, as a believer, you know, I'm, I'm um, hopefully <laughs> helping to spread the gospel through my example, right? Uh, what's, what's the famous phrase from uh, Francis of Assisi? Um, you know, preach the gospel everywhere and at all times, and if you must speak, you know, something like that, right? You know, so this this is w one thing to consider, you know. But but the other thing is, when we when we talk about um, you know promoting these great ideas, promoting virtue, there's an explicit way to do that, right? Where you're intentionally having a particular conversation and leading leading the students in a particular direction through your questions and so on, right? But it's also in the choice of the content, right? So uh, if we just take philosophy or literature, if you look at the books that our students are reading, uh, I mean, they're, they're beautiful, they're very vigorous, and they're probably uh, most of the same titles that you're going to see at good classical schools around the country, you know? And so w whether you're reading, uh, you know, Milton's Paradise Lost or, uh, you know, um, Divine Comedy, which we have here as well, uh, plays of Shakespeare, uh, Etc. I mean, we could just go on and on and on. The, the, the themes are there. The ideas are there. Uh, you know, the morality is there. The promotion of, you know, the, the moral imagination is inherent in what we do, you know. And, you know, most of the authors that are, are uh, on the, on the printed on the covers of our books, you know, wrote those books during, like, the era of Christendom and beyond, right? Mm -hmm. Now, obviously, Plato and Aristotle and the others were pre-Christian. But most of what they read here is not ancient classical, right? It, it comes, you know, after Christ, right? And so it's going to be, uh, you know, full, you know, that beauty of truth, the, the mystery, you know? And, and um, as I said, you know, if, if, look, if Christ is the truth, right? Isn't that what we say as Christians? He is the truth, right? Uh, he's not, the truth is not just a thing. It's, it's a person. Um, and if you are in pursuit of the truth, then won't you be led in that direction, right? Mm -hmm. And right. this is the idea. But blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, right? They will be filled, right? Uh, thank you for exploring that a little bit more with me. Uh, one of our very first uh, interviews, and, and I think the first episode that we launched was with Dr. Lou Marcos, and we mm -hmm. talked about the abolition of man. And mm -hmm. I don't know if you're very familiar with that text, but I think in some ways the um, one of the opportunities that a that a charter school has is to uh, re-examine um, our approach to education in such a way um, that that can be informed by Lewis's thoughts on the Tao and sort of these things that are just really, you know, as he would say, something like just our our it's it's true across the board. All humans and all all cultures have sort of recognized these truths, and and the abolition of man, as we noted in that interview. Um, is not a is not a Christian book. I would say it's a deeply religious book, but it's it's not specifically Christian. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. Well, yeah. I mean, it's it's not Christian 
it, well, it's not explicitly Christian to be sure. Right. Obviously, it's written by a Christian author who who had a vision, you know. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, I'd say, you know, like just actually thinking about the, uh, I don't know if it's technically the appendix of that book where he lists all of these sort of universal virtues, right, or, or, or beliefs, you know, like, okay, I mean, there you go. Like, th these are all the things that we're promoting here and more, um, you know, in fact, you know, just to, just to talk about virtue, we could say, well, yeah, so we teach maybe a type of Aristotelian virtue in one sense, like Nicomachean ethics looms large, you know. But when, when parents come here and, and we give them tours and they, they want to know, okay, well, what is classical education? What is it rooted in? Why we say it's rooted in the Western tradition. And what's, what's the Western tradition rooted in? Well, it's rooted in, yeah, okay, uh, Greco-Roman principles and Judeo-Christian principles, right? We, we say that. Yeah, I know, Jason, you bring uh, Lou Marcos in every year for your new teacher training. <laughs> we do, we do. Yes. Yeah, I would like you to talk a little bit about your particular um, model, your American, what is a American classical education? How is it, you know, unique or, and give us just the, a good right. definition of, of what that means. I would, okay, I would say this, it's going to sound, I would it sounds, it should, it ought to sound very similar to you know, uh, a definition of classical education. Now, I know maybe that's actually um, a little tricky because people are still toying with the definition. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But I would say this, it's a, it's a school that cultivates moral, intellectual, and civic virtue through a rigorous course of study in the liberal arts, the humane studies, um, the arts, what we might call the visual, performing arts and languages, and natural sciences. So I, I think the thing that we emphasize probably more than most, at least based on what I've uh, observed and then talking to other people, is, is the civic virtue. And just one example of how this uh, reveals itself is in how we sequence uh, what the students are learning, let's say in, in history, literature, uh, government. And you know, if you, if, well, at least in, in my experience and, and, and knowing about, about a good number of other classical schools, both, both private and charter, in, in high school, for instance, you might learn in, or in the early early grade there something about American history and you sort of go to the Middle Ages, to the Renaissance, and then you conclude the year with Greco-Roman studies where you can get into the deep and rich, you know, intellectual uh, endeavors there. Uh, some people will have like a, a type of omnibus class where they combine history, religious, religion, and, uh, excuse me, history, literature, and philosophy in one class, but it's typically the ancients, right? And the, ar the argument there is a good one, like how, like you're studying uh, Republic and you're reading uh, Cicero and you're del delving into these really rich, you know, sort of um, uh, foundational level uh, intellectual topics that need some maturity, right? Well, what, what we do there is reverse that. And we sort of take a Russell Kirk approach. Russell, Russell Kirk, of course, is He's known as the father, one of the fathers of conservatism, not necessarily political conservatism, but conservatism in general uh, in the 20th century. He wrote a book called The Roots of the American Order, uh, which I highly recommend uh, to everybody. And what he said is those roots are in five cities, right? Jerusalem, Athens, Rome, London, and Philadelphia. And that's the way that we teach the history and the literature. So we, we start in ninth grade with sort of the Hebrews, Greco-Roman history, uh, we go into, into British lit, medieval lit, then we go into early American in 11th grade, and same, same in history, and then in, in uh, 12th grade, it's modern history, modern, modern literature. Uh, and so the idea there is that, okay, you know, we've got this, this, this uh, moral, uh, moral and religious root in Jerusalem, we have the intellectual uh, endeavors in the arts uh, with Athens, and we move all the way up, you know, we get to Philadelphia, which we see as a type of culmination, not, not perfect to be sure, but a culmination of the, those thousands of years of, of that inheritance where we've got the tree of liberty. And this is where we want to emphasize, this is what we want to emphasize with our oldest students who are ready to go out, whether it's into college or mission work, as some of our students do, uh, work or perhaps to start a family early. Uh, and we want them to be, yes, good human beings who understand something about their humanity, who understand some of the complexities of the world, uh, we want them certainly to be prepared to go into the next phase of their their education journey, whether it's college or some vocation. But we want them to be good citizens, right? Yeah. Uh, who will help preserve the liberties that we have, help to, to preserve the republic, if it's I possible. Love, I love this. I'm, I'm I'm really glad you articulated this. And when I think of 
the idea that your school is has a real beautiful and hearty civics um, emphasis. It mm-hmm. kind of takes us back to the tradition of the paideia, of the Greeks and the focus of um, raising good citizens for the polis, right? And yes. It yes. seems to me that that element of it is very true to the tradition. Mm-hmm. Yes, um, well, and, and you know, if, if you read uh, the ancients, whether it's uh, Republic, uh, politics, any of the ancient political from Polybius, you know, what are they trying to accomplish there when it comes to polity? They're, they're trying to prevent tyranny and, and, to, and to help uh, provide the best form of government that serves the common good. Right. Well, you know, our, our school motto, one of, you know, our school motto, which is, which is a, a summary of at least the civic part of our, our school mission is scientia, virtus et libertas, knowledge, virtue, and liberty. And, and the idea there is that in order to preserve liberty, both societal liberty and our individual liberties that we have, we've got to have well-educated and virtuous people. We need both of those things. That's, in fact, the formula that, that the founding fathers expressed in so many different ways. We've got to have well-educated people. Why? Well, we can't be uh, deceived and duped you know, by tyrants, right? But we also have to have moral people because uh, immoral people will need a tyrant to keep them in check. You know, and so this is, you know, one of the really critical elements of what we did. And, and think about think about it this way. Like, oh, my gosh, I'm listening to this uh, incredible uh, discussion uh, that Jordan, Pe- or an interview that Jordan Peterson is, had given with, uh, uh, I think her name is pronounced Yanmi Park. She's a, a North Korean defector who, who wrote a um, you know, critical autobiography. And, you know, just to listen to the uh, dystopian the way of life in North Korea. It's like you'd think you're like in 1984, uh, listening to her description of, of the circumstances there, right? But think about, okay, well, of course, we're not there in the United States. Hopefully, you know, we're going to move in the other direction. But uh, we can have well-educated people. We can have faithful Christians here in this country. But if we don't have people that understand the, the civic roots and understand what our elected leaders ought to be doing, what the Constitution says uh, ought to be happening, we're going to be in big trouble. And we are. There are many Christians that I, that I speak to and, and see and hear that are just disconnected from reality when it comes to civic life. Not that civic, you know, civic life is the, the be-all and all, right? But we've right, got to be right. more engaged this way. Well, to go back to something you were saying earlier about when you were a younger teacher, noticing a lack in both knowledge and ability. And, and I want to circle back around to that in a minute. Um, but it sounds like one of your missions is to combat idiocy, right? Yeah. Uh, and and by that, of course, I'm I'm going back to that original idea of the term uh, in Greek, which is this private person, this person who was sort of um, not willing to contribute to the the life of the polis or the city. And mm-hmm. so and so in that way, it would seem that um, ideally those sorts of um, ways of thinking about oneself and one's role in, in a larger group um, would probably be able to work in concentric circles. So I would imagine, and and correct me if I'm wrong, but you'd probably want your students to think very intentionally about uh, their life and their family, and then about their life in their neighborhood and their life in their state and their country and kind of go out in those concentric circles Mm-hmm. in such a way uh, that they get out of their themselves and start to um, contribute to uh, society at large. But how do you do that in a world that is full of idiots and, and, and a lot of, a lot of um, our media and a lot of our culture is pushing idiocy? Mm-hmm. Well, I, yeah, I think we do it <laughs> one, one person at a time and one school at a time. We ha- so we have to be in this for the long game. But it, it took quite a while for our, for our society to get to the point that it is now. It didn't happen overnight. It, it might seem like it, it, you know, in some ways, especially as a result of the events of the last few years. But uh, yeah, I mean, that, that's how it has to happen. Look, so we have, uh, you know, in our um, Orthodox uh, tradition, uh, a saint, uh, Seraphim Masarov, who said, and it's, it's translated in a couple of different ways, but, uh, you know, if you acquire the Holy Spirit, then thousands, thousands around you will be saved, right? So, you know, the idea there is let, let's uh, pr- promote personal, individual virtue, both moral virtue and, say, civic virtue, 
and and that will you know have a have a positive effect, right? Uh, it doesn't mean that we shouldn't be you know trying to you know sort of export ideas to a bigger audience. We, should, we can do two things at once, but I, I think we have to we have to we have to start where we are, and where we are actually is with ourselves. Like we we as adults uh, have to do more. Yeah. Set, set an example and improve ourselves. Well, I know one of the things that you do that I love, and I'd like you to talk a little bit about, and then we're going to get into your how great you are at teacher retention. Um, we'll talk about that in a minute. But I, you do such a great job at having celebrations of American holidays. And mm-hmm. I know you bring in guest speakers. And I'd like you to tell our listeners a little bit about some of the programs you do in that direction. It's wonderful. Right. So we have a, a colloquia at different times of year. So, so one of the big ones that we have annually is called the Bill of Rights Day Colloquium. Bill of Rights Day is in, it's, it's, a, it's not one of the 11 federal holidays, but it's a federal commemoration, you know, recognizing when the Bill of Rights was adopted. And so we always bring in a speaker of some sort uh, that, that we've not had before. It could be a pro- professor, it could be somebody associated with civic education. Uh, and then we also bring Dr. David Bob, who's the president of the Bill of Rights Institute, to come in. So we have two speakers. We we have a you know a, a big gym full of juniors plus parents and others from the community that come in. And so the, the topics there somehow connect to the Bill of Rights and the Constitution, you know, toward a toward a good civic end. That's that's one of the things we do. We we have other uh, speakers that come in. Some some people that hold political office. Uh, some people that. You know, for instance, we had, you know, we had our governor, you know, here, uh, you know, in the winter, you know, who came to speak as well. Uh, but we also do things, uh, you know, commemorations on, on days within the school. So so Veterans Day is, uh, you know, of course, something I think we all, you know, like to remember and to honor our veterans. Like we, you know, now with COVID the last couple of years, that's been more limited. But, you know, we'll, we'll have a big Veterans Day celebration uh, where we'll bring all the veterans of, of uh, you know, relatives related to our students and we will honor each of them and the branch that they serve in will sing some of the the, uh, the military anthems for them of course the national anthem as well but th- those are a couple a couple of examples but we we also like to bring in people uh, from local government like we've we've had the mayor you know from Louisville here before we've had local you know representatives and uh you know we want them to understand that you know these these things that we're talking about in a you know in a in, a, in the civic arena are not just on paper and not just in a book this, these are real things, and you know, citizenship is uh, is a responsibility and a, and a reality. And, and at some point, uh, whether we want to or not, you know, we're going to be faced with some big civic decisions of our own. I'm I'm reminded of uh, Lewis's saying about irrigating deserts, mm-hmm. and I wish I could remember the whole quote. But I can imagine that um, some pushback you you may get, or or some some critic may say, well. You know, it, it, there, there's there's a real risk here of, you know, sort of um, instilling sort of this this national pride that leads to nationalism, right? Mm-hmm. And and this is this is very much in vogue today to to just sort of um, it's it's kind of cool to not uh, not to be proud to be an American, right? Mm-hmm. And and one can see how a, a study of history, you know, um, might uh, lend itself to at least um a healthy fear of 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 that sort of um extremism but i i don't think we're largely at risk and and i'm i'm happy to be corrected here but i don't think we're largely at risk of people um going too far in that direction i think if anything we have um a growing uh, number of uh of young people who are just very apathetic about their country Mm-hmm. Right. And and so that's why I'm reminded of this idea of irrigating deserts, because, you know, if, if they don't have any sort of love for for land and country and their people, um, how then can they, you know, come to do anything but but have this very self-centered approach to life? You know, as long as as long as things are good for me and, uh, mm-hmm. and I'm getting what I want, you know, uh, the rest of this place can can go to hell in a handbasket, so to speak, which, of course, doesn't work because. Um, obviously we need a well-functioning country in order for us to continue to enjoy and benefit from all the things that, that we do. Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, I think, um, apathy is fairly common among a lot of young people as well as, you know, what, what was the subject of abolition of man, subjectivism or, or, 
relativism. I think it's maybe a little bit more uh, natural or prevalent in young people in in early teens. And so the the way that, and we we see that (laughs) all the time, even with the students that have been here for, for, for a good period. But what we also see is that because of the cumulative effect of what they're getting here in their history, in their philosophy, in their logic, in their moral philosophy class, you know, the, the cumulative effect of all of that is by the time they're seniors, they've, they've sort of really thought through, you know, all of these kinds of things, uh, both, you know, sort of philosophical, civic. And when, by the time they're seniors, they're, they're in a much different place, you know, than they were before. And so I think, again, thinking about the long hauls, like we, we can't be impatient when we see young people that, who are apathetic. And maybe that's because of what's going on at home or the news they listen to. But I think some of it is the age. And, and frankly, the other part of it is, look, we live in the most... Uh, I was going to say sophisticated, but actually it's not that sophisticated here. Uh, affluent, you know, pampered civilization that ever existed in terms of the great mass of people that are experiencing this this wealth, right? And those have had de- deleterious moral effects on us, right? And so that's that's the other area where, where we have to work. You know, it helps students, you know, understand some things uh, related to, to self-discipline, right? Moderation and so on. So th- those are elements of, of character, you know, a virtue that have to be cultivated as well. That's true. Well, Jason, mm-hmm. I know that, um, you know, we're, we're running low on time, <laughs> but I want, I want, before we end, I really want to hear you give some wise words of wisdom <laughs> to people who are listening that mm-hmm. struggle with teacher retention. And mm-hmm. I know the headmasters are eager to retain great teachers and you are so good at hiring great teachers, at keeping mm-hmm. great teachers, at bringing former students back as teachers. They want to yeah. come back, you know. <clears throat> and and so I'd like you to share with our listeners some of the most successful strategies for all of these issues. Well, okay. So uh, I guess the, the first thing is hiring the right people, right? I mean, you, you've got to start there. You have to you have to obviously uh, bring in people that want to do this for. for a good period of time. You know, there's some people that, you know, come out of college, it might seem like really good candidates. They're not really sure what they want to do. Maybe they see this as sort of a rest stop, you know, before going on to something else. And not that they can't come in for a year or two and make a good contribution to the school. But uh, as you probably know, you, you don't really start hitting your stride as a teacher until a few years in. And so you'd rather have people, you know, staying for the long term. So that's that's one thing. Now, I know sometimes it's it's hard to know if someone will stay, you know, if they, if they plan from the beginning to keep teaching as a vocation. Uh, but the other thing is, um, what can you find out about the person, not only through their, the recommendations that they bring in, but in the interview itself? And I like for me, there are three critical areas that I really investigate. And they, they sort of correspond to, um, you know, the, the elements of rhetoric that Aristotle, you know, talks about, uh, logos, pathos, and ethos, right? Now, I know those are appeals, right? But I'm sort of using them as qualities maybe that, that a good teacher would have. So do they have, you know, strong content knowledge, right? So that they can come right in and feel comfortable teaching the content, whatever it is at whatever grade level. Uh, they don't necessarily have to have the best abilities in terms of the, t- the teaching because we will foster that here. We'll provide some training. We'll give them a mentor. Over time, that will come if they're with it, right? Uh, the, then the second thing is, do they have a visible passion? Number one, the young human beings that are going to be in front of them, do they love children? And then secondly, do they love the content uh, uh, in which it, that they'll be teaching, right? They've got to have that because that's going to rub off you know, on the students. And that will then come back to them in terms of the experience that they have. And then you know, the third thing is, in terms of ethos, okay, are they people of char- good character? Now, I know you can't always tell that when you're meeting somebody, uh, even, even with the recommendations, but are, they, are these people striving to live virtuously? If they have those three things, that means they're in line, uh, in alignment with our mission, right, what, what we're aiming to do here. And so right off the bat, you're going to have somebody who's going to be more likely to stay in something like this because they believe in it. They, they, they want to be surrounded by like-minded people, you know, understanding that what we're doing is truly good here, right? Uh, so after that, then it's a matter of okay, well, what kind of what kind of 
culture does the school have that will keep someone in place? You know, if you're in a school where uh, you, you have the normal daily struggles that teachers have and teaching, good teaching is really hard. You know, mm. first year teaching is probably the hardest thing that most people do in their lives. If they're, if they're doing it well, right? I mean, it's, it's, it really wears you down, you know? So do you, do you have a, a culture in place, a, an environment that supports the teacher, that encourages the teacher? And when, you know, there's maybe a difficulty with a parent or a student or something, that does the student, does the teacher, you know, confidently believe that you as the headmaster are going to be supporting them, right? What would be a few things that you would consider good support for the teacher? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, you know, most of the parents that we have here are great. You know, they're really supportive. They believe in our mission. Um, but, you know, every now and then you'll have some parents who um, maybe, I know, I know there are different names for these kinds of parents, you know, the, the lawnmower parent, the helicopter parent, so forth and so on, who uh, they, 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 they totally cover their children. Uh, and rather than, you know, let's say something goes wrong, whether it's with an academic issue or behavior issue, Rather than, okay, let me, let me talk to the teacher and find out what's going on with my child, they listen to the, teacher, the, the, the child's account and then go blast the teacher, right? Um, and so, like, teachers need to know that, okay, you know, if we, if we certainly if we believe that the teacher is doing what she ought to be doing, that we're going to support the teacher. We're not going to let a parent come in and, you know, ram through, you know, some agenda. Uh, we're not going to let uh, parents or anybody disrespect teachers. We want, we want teachers, and, and on, on this note, this is really important. Teachers, come, part of the reason teachers come here and they stay here is they know that they can actually teach here. It's an orderly environment. If you walk down the halls, as and we have visitors all the time, they and we come into classrooms. They one of the things they they usually say is, "Wow, I, I actually I'm a little bit surprised because I think they're expecting to see a little, at least a little bit of chaos, you know, or." students off task and so on, but you walk into a literature class or math class and the students are engaged in the seminar. They're doing the math, whatever it is, you know? Um, and so if, if you teach in, and I'm sorry to say this, I think in most modern schools, it, it's a zoo sometimes. Yeah. I, and I've been in schools where I've walked down a hallway between classes and the profanity, the things, the, 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 the body language of the students, the way they're dressed, uh, like it's just, it's kind of scary. And in, in, uh, in, in having served in schools, uh, public schools for a long time, you know, you could walk down a hallway and maybe the first classroom you look into, oh, it's pretty good. Like the kids are engaged, the teacher's, you know, dynamic. The next class is a zoo. The third class, the teacher's reading a newspaper. You know, mm -hmm. uh, the fourth class might be something in between. Like my expectation here is that if you're teaching at the school, you're here to teach, right? Uh, you're going to have a well-ordered classroom. And when students misbehave as they do, they're, they're humans. Uh, you're going to provide an appropriate consequence that should be done in love, right? But that um, we've got things in place that will help to maintain order and hopefully to bring that students that student back, you know, back in, in in into a good way. I think that's really important. Like you need to know, okay, I'm not a babysitter, I'm not a jail keeper, I'm a teacher, right? I can teach here. And you are right? really great at supporting the teachers. I know this. I substitute taught at your school. I remember. <laughs> you are very good at encouraging your teachers um, and supporting them, I think, not only um, with training and good teaching, but even emotionally. There, there was like a really beautiful atmosphere, culture in your school of, I don't even know how to say if emotional support is the right way to put it, but you just felt like you could feel the order and the harmony in the school and mm -hmm. the... And the protection even of the protection of doing the things that are true and good and beautiful was in place. I just don't know how you do it, Jason. I want your, I want to know your secrets because you do a great job well, at it. Well, uh, here's the thing. We have a lot of great, great people here, really good educators who love what they're doing. And here, one of the things that I talk about, you know, every year is we have a, a faculty of friends striving for excellence, right? Mm -hmm. We have much in common we all have the same purpose in mind. And, you know, so we enjoy being with one another and talking about things, whether it's classroom topics or those outside the classroom. Um, and I, I like the people that are here. Like I, I have relationships with them. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, there's a line. Okay, I'm the headmaster, right? But at the same time, I'm their friend. Like, I, you know, 
we're, we're in this endeavor together. Uh, oh, this is great. In yeah. fact, this reminds me, I uh, recently we interviewed Gary Hartenberg on his wonderful new book on Aristotle that mm. was produced by Classical Academic Press. Great book, very easy to read. It only took me a few hours to read. It was wonderful. And he and I did uh, an additional podcast interview for our Patreon supporters, and we talked a lot about friendship and happiness mm. and got to the to the crux of the matter about how important friendship is and what is Aristotelian friendship and right. how can, and I said to him, how can you create a culture in your school that is an Aristotelian culture of friendship? And that mm -hmm. is what you feel when you go into your school. That's very much there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yes. and, and giving the teachers and the students time to cultivate friendships is a, it's an element that I think is missing in a lot of schools. Mm -hmm. And I think understanding, I'm so glad you read Nick and McKean ethics because then they know, they understand this is what a friendship, this is what friendship is. <laughs> it's yeah. in there. Yeah. I think so friendship is a, is a key word. Um, and, and I love that you said a faculty of friends. Hmm. Uh, that reminds me of uh, the work of John senior. Uh, John senior is someone that I, I read a lot and find myself quoting a lot uh, here recently. Um, another thing that he, he discusses um sort of in, in this realm of talking about the faculty being friends, he also talks about the fact that the, the faculty is the school, right? And how the students come and go, right? I mean, they're certainly a part of the school in a sense, but really they're coming to be schooled, so to speak, or to receive something from the faculty. And ideally the faculty remains like a rock. And, mm -hmm. and then the next wave of students comes and, 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 and washes over them and, and goes back out to sea, as it were. Uh, that's not John Sr. I just came up with that off the top of my head. <laughs> uh, but um, faculty retention um, seems to me to be so important in the life of a school because otherwise the parents don't know what school to expect year after year right? Right. because there's no, there's no um, stability. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, let me, I, I want to speak to that specifically, but I want to go back to something you said about the faculty being the school uh, uh, in, in, in our recent graduation or commencement that we had for our seniors. One of the, um, one of the, the, the parents that was, was there, actually it was, um, actually it was, well, I think it was one of our teachers who's a parent. Yeah. So she told me there, there were some people from another classical school at our graduation. I think they had, they were fam had family friends there. And they were they were complimenting the ceremony, but one of the things that, that stood out to them is that at the beginning of our commencement, we had, in fact, all of our faculty process in with the students and they're in their regalia, right? They they lead the way and they sit right next to the to the platform uh, in in the room. And I introduce all of them one at a time, and we honor them first, you know, before carrying on with the commencement. And I guess the, the people from this other school said, "Oh, wow, that's." That's something distinctive about your school. Like we don't do that at our school, and that actually says something, you know, about what you value, you know, at the school. And here's, but and, and it, this connects to something that I told the seniors before the ceremony. I said, I said, I asked them. I said, I've got kind of a trick question for you. Like, whose graduation ceremony is this? And of course, their first response is, "Oh, it's ours. It's mine. I'm a senior, you know." And no, I said, "It's it's the school's." <laughs> There have been seven of them before you, and there will be more after you. Yes, we're honoring you tonight uh, in this ceremony in large part, but it's the schools. And as you say, the faculty uh, is, is that part of the school that, that is here before, during, and after, right? So that's, that's, uh, that, that's really important. I think, I think uh, that story really, really captures it. <laughs> and the fact okay. that you would communicate that to the students, I think, says a lot about how you lead as a headmaster. Mm -hmm. um, I think the ability to speak to students in such a way that that is clarifying and and sort of opens their eyes to the reality versus sort of talking down to them or trying to you know cater to them in a certain way. It's like no, this these are this is what's going on here, right? right. And and I had a heart to heart with my with my students before. Uh, before they did a, a Christmas program because they were just not having it. Like they didn't want to do the the songs and the dances and wear the the hats and everything. And I said, look guys, this is not for you. This is for your parents. This is for your grandparents. Um, and the same is true, uh, notably, um, for, uh, you know, a, a young couple getting married, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, yes, is it their wedding? Sure. But the whole ceremony and the whole... Um, 
presentation and 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 the the you know processing down the aisle and and all of the flowers i mean this is for the community that is bearing witness to this union uh, before god right and so to think that it's all about the bride or all about the the groom is to miss really uh, the larger thing at play there. And I think the same can be said about the life of, of a school. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, what it is, you know, just thinking about marriage, like school, it's a communion event uh, in the Greek word kinonia, you know. Um, so it's, you know, communion with God, communion with one another as the newly married couple and communion with all the family and friends that are worshiping there and celebrating, you know, with you. And we have a, a communion here at school, right? Mm -hmm. It's a Again, we say a faculty of friends, a community of friends, a community of um, developing friendships among the students as they get older, right? That you know, so so we start here with five-year-olds and finish with eighteen-year-olds. So you know, uh, the the relationship that we develop with the children grows into a much more mature relationship over time. So that you know, when they're ready to to depart, like we're in a, not certainly not on a uh, on an equal uh, you know level. In terms of our knowledge and our maturity, but it's significantly closer. We're, we're in a very uh, similar wavelength, that, so that we're we're having conversations more like friends might over rich topics. That's right. Uh, to to think about your students as future friends is something that I encourage. Uh, mm -hmm. To 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 look forward to the day when you know you can come back and instead of calling me Mr. Bailey, maybe you can shake my hand and call me Trey. And, and I'll be so excited to hear about all the things that you're doing in your life, you know, uh, years down the road. And so uh, maybe we could just uh, speak briefly about maybe uh, alumni relationships, if you could touch on that a little bit, and then uh, that'll probably move us towards the end of our conversation. Okay. Well, we have, we've had, uh, as I mentioned, eight graduating classes now. And so we get quite a few alumni visiting. Um, in part because they live in the area and they come back to visit. Some of them have younger siblings that are still at the school. Uh, we see them at activities, um, you know, whether it's a Christmas pageant or some game of some sort, or they just come to have lunch, you know, with their, their brother or sister, you know, in school. Uh, we also have uh, alumni, as uh, Adrian mentioned, that are teaching here at the school. We have multiple graduates who are now teaching. In fact, we just, we just hired one more who will be teaching fourth grade for us and another one who is, we've, just about hired, uh, and uh, that, that's very exciting for us that they um, that they that they love the school so much that they'd want to actually come back and teach here, right? Uh, that, I think that that says you know quite a bit about their experiences, and we we invite them back. You know, we we want them here. Uh, I told I told them at the commencement, you guys are part of our family. You will always be part of our family, and always welcome home. This is your alma mater. You know, uh, so that's 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 an important part of part of the founder's experience. So, uh, yeah, I mean, well, here's one of the things that's kind of interesting, just, you know, it's, it's difficult to measure, certainly quantitatively, like, okay, uh, how has this education benefited them? Like, how can you tell if they've become good, <laughs> good people, good citizens uh, who can make their way in this complex world? Well, we, we certainly don't know that in any kind of detail, but in one area, uh, which is further studies is, you know, 99% of our students go right into college afterwards. They come back and they tell us, you know, the first year of college was actually pretty easy as a result of the experience they had. We even had students, and I remember one uh, that was part of the first graduating class. She was in her first year of college in somewhere here in Texas, I won't say where, but she emailed uh, one, of, one of her teachers here and said, hey, you know, could you send me some titles of some good books? <laughs> because I'm not getting fed here enough, you know, at this at this school, you know. Uh, and I suspect, you know, students at good classical schools around the country, you know, have, have a similar kind of experience. So that's, at least that's like one way we can tell that something is going well here, that they're not stumped at the next level, that they're well prepared, at least for the academic, you know, part of it. Um, and, and we hear that all the time, all the time. It's true. Yeah. Well, and I think isn't Dr. Mar Lou Marcos's daughter teaches at your school as well? She does. Yes, she's a she's a music teacher. Yes, in her yeah. fourth, she's completed her fourth year. Yeah, he loves your school. I know that. Um, well, we close all all of our podcasts out with um, you can choose one of the two questions. One is what is a quote from a book that has had a huge impact on you, mm -hmm. um, or what book do you wish you had read sooner in your life? 
Right. Well, I, I guess my answer to this question would would actually answer both of those those questions. The quote is is um, from um, Norms and Nobility. Uh, yeah, I'm sure you're, you're, you've both read that book, uh, and you know from from Hicks, and he says in there in one chapter, education reflects primary assumptions about the nature of man. And uh, so, first of all, I wish I had like thought about that earlier and read that book earlier. But that that quote really encapsulates, you know, like what what we're trying to do, you know. So if you look at a common public school education you can tell what they believe about human beings by virtue of the education they're giving them, which is a, an economic education. You know, they, they see children maybe as a commodity, right, to serve in the community in some kind of economic capacity, right? Uh, you know, whereas in a classical school, we have a much, a much different vision. And so, you know, if, if, you, if you have a good understanding about human nature and you recognize that it's certain, certainly mixed, you know, when it, when you, when you think about uh, morality, but the, the fact that we are rational creatures, political creatures, we're ensouled, right? We, we are created in the image and likeness of God. If, if this is what you think about human beings, that they're supposed to have a special dignity by virtue of this nature, then you're going to provide a particular kind of education to them, right? This, so, so this is really critical. That's right. Can you say that quote again? Education reflects primary assumptions about the nature of man. That gets at the heart of it. Yes. Yeah. Well, thank you, Jason. This was a real treat. Appreciate it so much. I know our listeners can love it. And I'd love to encourage our listeners, if they have any further questions or reactions to this podcast, to post on our Facebook page. And I think I'll be anxious to hear if we have some further questions. And if we do, I'll send them on to you. <laughs> All right. Adrian Trey, thank you so much. It was good to speak with you. Thank, thank you, you, sir. Thank you so much for listening. We invite you to experience the art of teaching through interactive learning communities at our Patreon page. Visit patreon.com forward slash classical education. Also, be sure to join the conversation on our Facebook community at facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash classical education. We are a listener supported podcast, so your support makes this podcast possible. As the great artist and educator John Ruskin once wrote, Well, my friends, the final result of the education I want you to give your children will be, in a few words, this. They will know what it is to see the sky. They will know what it is to breathe it. And they will know, best of all, what it is to behave under it as in the presence of a Father who is in heaven. <laughs>